I'm going to start recording. Yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> that was supposed to be Barb's job. Um, so I'd like to introduce Nicole Thompson. She is a literacy coach and works. I guess you can introduce yourself because the okay. connection was made through Katie Birch. What we're going to do is um, Nicole has a, a bit of a presentation to show, but if there are questions that you would like addressed, if you could put them in the chat, and what I will do is interject at certain points of the presentation and get Nicole to address those because, you know, Nicole has information to share with you, but as in all good PD, we really want you to have the voice and choice to be getting those questions answered that you have. And um, I know that Nicole is really flexible in presenting. Is that okay, Nicole? Sounds good. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if you want to know how many people are here, but it's I can see, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got it open. <laughs> That's okay. awesome. So without further ado, um, we do have a 10, uh, 10 o'clock finish time um, that we, uh, would like to, we know that it's a lot of listening this way. It's like, like the kids, right? We can only attend for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but we can invite Nicole back if there's a need to do so. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole. I will watch for Barb, who will be taking over in moderating the chat. And um, just please use the, the chat to add your questions. And I will see you guys in a little bit. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I know I know a lot of you that are on right now. So I just wanted to say hello again. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I did work at RDSB for over 10 years, up until a couple years ago when I moved to Thunder Bay. And so I was pretty excited when Katie called me and asked if I would do some PD with RDSB this time, um, because I've been doing boards that obviously I haven't been connected with before. So I was very excited about this. They asked me to do a balanced literacy session that I had actually done in February for a board up north. And so I'm hoping that, uh, I know you have, some of you have a lot of balanced literacy training possibly, especially if you've been in this for 20 plus years. So I'm hoping you can still get something out of today, whether it just be a refresher or you can lead some discussions uh, and give your ideas. And for those of you that are new, hopefully this will be a, a good overview of what balanced literacy is and some of the components. But a little bit about um, why I'm here. Like the past couple of years, I did leave the classroom um, because my husband got a job here. And I've been at the college teaching. I teach in their HR program um, because I do have an HR degree from before I went into teaching. So that's been a bit of a learning curve with the uh, topic of human resources again it's been a long time so as opposed to as i went from kindergarten into adult learning as well which was another big learning curve um i'm still convinced there's nobody on earth that are that work harder than people in the elementary education system so um i i do know where you're coming from i can relate uh, i have been doing these workshops for just over a year now for connected north uh, anywhere from some math lessons and art lessons to balanced literacy, uh, classroom management. So again, this is one I was very excited about. This is the biggest one I've done with over 100 people attending. So I hope that there's lots of discussion in the chat. I will give you time to, you know, write some things down yourself and share in the chat so that we can have this more like a PD session where we share ideas with each other because Again, I'm not an expert here coming to you, but it's all of our combined ideas and things that are working for us um, and our experiences that help make this a better environment. Uh, so I'm in my uh, home office too, in my bedroom. So I've got you on my bed so that you can see my desk behind me as opposed to seeing my bedroom, my bed behind me. So I hope I'm not fumbling too many things here as I'm, again, working from my bed, as I think probably some of you are working from your bedrooms as well. I won't be the only one. But I am curious how things have been going for you and what you have been doing. Um, obviously a lot of PD. I was, I was just wondering how you've been holding up this past month and what does work look like for you? Um, are some of you connected with your students right now? 
with teachers in the classroom. How have you, how has this been going? And if anyone wants to share in the chat, I have been curious. I do understand you are getting a lot of PD and this is a great time for that. While you're sharing with me, I'm going to share my screen. Connecting the students every day, oh, that's good. Nicole, hi, it's Barb Dennis. Sorry about hi. that. I was I, I first I tried to get on, on my computer and then I tried on my surface, then on my phone, now I'm back to my surface. So I'm in. Um, okay. I think I think it really varies from school to school and, and teacher to teacher and how much contact they've been able to make with with their students. I think everybody's really giving it their best shot at doing that. Some are having more success than others. For sure. This is this is difficult. I know those of us that have kids at home as well. It's uh, it's been a learning curve and a struggle for some of of the kids. So you can understand what they must be go. Our students must be going through as well, right? I know my my two children are ready to go back to school. They thought this was a lot of fun at the beginning, and now they're they're really missing school and not so much enjoying the um, all the activities on the iPad. They just want to be in the classroom. All right, so I'm hoping everyone can see my my slides here, but with this up, I'm not seeing the chat. That's the only, so Barb, if thing, you'll just um, interrupt me, okay, if things do come Absolutely. through the chat. Yep. Thank you. All right. So who can relate to this? <laughs> I, I got dressed today. I made sure I was completely dressed for work today. Um, but I think some of us can relate to this working from home in our pajamas, as many of you, I'm sure, are doing right now. And we are, as I mentioned, going to do a review, uh, an overview of balanced literacy. And to start that, let's think about what, uh, what we know about it already. Okay, what does it look like in your classroom? And what does it mean by balanced? So I'm hoping for ideas here. So if you want to just put your ideas in the chat, then I can relay those back to uh, Nicole. And I know some of you know what balanced literacy is and what it means to have a balance. We are providing many opportunities through various forms of text engaging students with making connections on personal experiences. Uh, reading in different ways, like together, buddy reading. Yes. And the key there too is that different ways, right? So when we talk about balanced literacy, we're trying to give literacy to our students in different ways. We have to have um, a variety. Small group, one-to-one, -one, large group, comprehension, fluency. Now, how about the components? Does anybody know what the five main components are? I may interrupt your thinking as I keep going just to make sure we stay on time a bit, but keep um, adding to the chat. Did we get some of those? <laughs> so there are five, depending on what, um, you can, you know, you can Google a lot of things about balanced literacy. You can read books, you can go to different experts in the field and they're not all necessarily the exact same components. 
Some have shared and interactive as one or just one or the other. Some include word study, others don't. Um, I've seen models that don't include the modeled side of things. So um, in general, these are the ones that are typically found um, in all, in all um, aspects, I guess, some way or another. So we want to be modeling, which is what we're doing ourselves for our students. We want some type of shared and interactive where they're starting to participate and then we guide them uh, and then they do things independently. So word studies also put in there because it's very important uh, to be doing, you know, phonological awareness and phonics and things like that to, um, to incorporate into their reading and writing. So it's kind of stuck there as a sixth component um, because I said, depending on where you look, you'll see these six components all broken up or shared and in different ways. So I wanted to keep them all here for you. But the five that I know um, are our DSBs followed would be the modeled shared interactive guide and independent and they all follow this idea of the gradual release of responsibility okay, that's key here we start with i do it then we do it together and then you do it okay? and then when they're doing it we see what's our next step and that leads us back to okay i do it for the next step what we're, our next need is then we practice that together and then you can practice it on your own what do we need next? And it's, it's that cycle, okay? But it's always a gradual release of responsibility. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that already. Um, you've, some of you are probably experts in this because you are working with students that need that extra support at first. And as you gradually release things to them. And here's one, you'll see on this, um, this model here, shared is by itself. So we can put shared and interactive in that quadrant, right? So if we start at modeled, that looks like things like the teacher, EA, ECE, okay, educator. Modeling read alouds, modeling um, a writing activity. So we're doing it ourselves. We're explicitly teaching as we go. And we do a lot of thinking aloud. And we're going to talk more about think alouds in a minute because this is a really important piece for us to, to remember as we are doing our models. Because as students watch you do something, they don't necessarily know why you're doing it or what's making it effective. So we need to make sure we're using you know, our think alouds so that they can read our minds. Okay? Why are we doing what we're doing? Because they won't know otherwise. So we'll talk about think alouds in a moment. And then shared and interactive is when we do these things together. Okay, so that looks, it might look like big books, um, things on the, like poems on the chart stand where students can come up and, you know, take the pen and write some words in or do some word activities. And that would be an interactive. Uh, shared is more when the teacher does all the writing, but both I, is the idea that they are sharing the discussion, the ideas, and doing it together, but the teacher still holds more of the responsibility um, as a po when it comes to the reading and writing. Moving into guided, we're giving a little more responsibility to our students. We're still, now we're in small groups typically, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. You could do this whole group, um, but it definitely works better a small group. Uh, and that's where the students are gonna be practicing the strategies that you've modeled that they've practiced a little bit with you during those shared activities. And now they get to practice on their own as you kind of watch over and guide them, uh, listen in, okay, you might be conferencing with them and helping them to stay on track with uh, their strategies that they're working on. And after they've gotten comfortable with this, they're gonna move into the independent stage and that looks like them doing it all on their own. It could be quiet reading time where they're reading independently at their level. Uh, it could be writer's workshop where they're writing uh, and you'll, again, we're, we're never just letting them go on their own and not checking in again. We still have to check in with them, um, ask questions, get discussions going, make sure they're focusing on their strategies, but they are doing it at their independent level. And then we see what they need next to move forward. And then we'll start modeling those types of strategies. So this is the idea. It goes with reading and writing. Um, but this concept of the gradual release. Again, if there's any questions, you want me to say something, um, speak to something more, just put it in the chat and Barb can interrupt me here. 
All right. So modeling, so I'm just going to get a sip of water here. So teacher EA are doing the actual work. Okay? We are showing the students what we want them to learn. So we have to have a focus. We can't teach everything at once. We need to know we like not to overwhelm students if we start talking about predictions uh, and inferring, inferring, inferring and um, voice and all sorts of in punctuation, spaces between our words. If we talk about all of this in one activity, they will be so overwhelmed. So we have to make sure we're modeling with a focus. We always will use expression when we read. Okay? I will always use my punctuation when I write, but I won't necessarily make that a focus for them uh, to be noticing or be thinking aloud about uh, unless that's what we're working on. And that's what I want them to start practicing. Okay? But I will always do my job making sure I'm, I'm you know, an effective reader and writer and modeling all of these all the time. But it comes to how much do they need to be focusing on. So think alouds help, um, help the students understand what makes uh, our writing or reading effective. And so it brings, that, it brings that focus to them, okay? It verbalizes our thoughts. So we're gonna do a little activity where I have a, who here knows Mo Willems? <laughs> in my kindergarten class, actually, I think Norma Jean, this was the year you were in with me, we did um, Elephant and Piggy. We did an author study and we learned how to draw Elephant and Piggy and we made our own book and all sorts of things. But there's a lot you can learn from simple books. Um, again, this would be a lower grade activity, but th these, act these um, exercises can be done with any, with any level. But for example, the think aloud we're gonna talk about here is about expressions. What are, what are these characters thinking and how do we know? Okay, what are they feeling, right? So if, if I wanted to do this activity with my students, Mo Willems is really good at, even though his illustrations are extremely simple, the emotion that comes through and the, the amount that you can say to these characters, where is it here? Right here, look at how he's, okay, so as I'm reading, I could say, this is where Piggy thinks that he's a frog, okay? And he keeps saying, I'm a frog, you're a frog? I didn't know that. I was sure you were a pig, right? So he goes on and on and he, Elephant gets really scared because Piggy's turned into this frog and he thinks he might turn into a frog, okay? Right here, oh, what if I become a frog? So my think aloud would be, wow, he looks really scared. I wonder why he doesn't want to become a frog. You know, hopping all day long, eating flies. Oh. He looks like he's disgusted with the thought of having to eat flies. Okay, so I'm just thinking in my mind, I'm bringing their attention to those pictures and that we can learn a lot from, from um, their facial expressions. So just something that would be a simple little focus, um, but you could get a lot out of just having that one short book. Um, any other ideas for what you could do for think alouds? Nicole, I wonder what your opinion is on this. A long time ago, we were involved in a, a literacy um, improvement project with the Ministry of Education. And one of the suggestions was that when you were doing think alouds to actually say like, you know, oh, when I read that, that makes me think, can you kind of put the book down so that they know that, um, so that kids understand that what's coming out of your mouth is your thinking and not something that you're seeing in the, in the book. Yes, perfect. It's funny you mention that because I have right now, I did the slides here, but I probably should have. I've got um, some think aloud examples. And one is that, yeah, oh, I predict, I think that this reminds me. And I like the idea that you put the book down and you stop. It actually think alouds help pull back the pace of reading the book and make students comprehend better because they can slow down. They can think about what's going on and you can help them comprehend and they see you taking those pauses and understanding that that's what I'm supposed to do. 
Okay. Um, a little personal connection. My daughter was reading the other day. Uh, she was reading in French because she's now in French school. And her teacher said, you know, I don't think she's understanding necessarily this book, but she's reading it well. So can you watch that? So, I, okay. Next time I'm reading with her, she like speeds through this page. And I said, what did you just read? Tell me what you just read. And she looked at me sheepishly. I said, did you understand what you read? No. <laughs> So here was a perfect example for me to say, okay, well, we need to stop. We need to say, what's going on in this book? Take some time. Look at the pictures. And so without me having to tell her what the book was about, I was able to pull her back, go through it slowly, do some think alouds. And then she ended up understanding that page, but it took me, um, you know, putting the brakes on and doing my think alouds with her. So I really like that idea of stopping because they need to realize we don't just speed through a book with no thoughts um, and no connections. And the second piece here is discussion. So having those discussions with your students. Um, and it is, it's a balancing act because we don't wanna stop the story completely where they start forgetting what we were talking about and then we jump back into the story and they have to remember what the, next, the earlier pages said. So it is a balancing act a little bit between having those discussions. And that's why I think it's just important to have the focus on what are we going to stop and discuss today in this book um, and why are we going to do it. And oftentimes they'll jump in and have those discussions impromptu, right? So they're kind of leading that as well. Um, but yeah, the idea here is that the teachers are still taking ownership over the process and modeling the behaviors with that focus, but students get to participate in those discussions as you, as you think aloud. But is this really something agree with that, Nicole? I really, sorry for interrupting, but I really agree with that because you know we can we can um, we can really kill a book with too much discussion too. And like there's really if you pick one or two really key focuses when you're doing that, it, it can teach the kids the points, but they can also enjoy the story, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and for older kids, one a good thing I remember somebody saying one time is when they're reading like that and it's like if you if it's like they should have a movie going on in their head and if all of a sudden they can't picture anymore of the movie that's happening then they they're lost what the comprehension piece is for sure so that's a good a good point for people who are working with older kids when they're reading what's the movie look like like in your head right now definitely thank you um somebody in the chat uh Jean, oh yeah, the kids love Mo. And from Joanne, um, a lot of time the students finish uh, think finishing the book is their job, not comprehending it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and and that's where we come in, making sure that we we don't focus necessarily on you know reading levels or how many books we can get through, but how many we can enjoy and connect to, and right finding those books that make us. Um, want to read them as opposed to how many books did I get through? Yes. So that come, that's on us to make sure that reading for them is meaningful and fun too. The shared and interactive piece, I, I'll spend the least amount of time here, um, but as it can go again, reading and writing, because we're talking about literacy in general and not one or the other, but Writing will typically be, uh, a lot of times you'll see in the full, full class settings or small groups, but it's a great way, like morning message, things like this are great ways to bring that uh, interactive piece where kids can come up, um, they can you know, write sight words in your messages, you can maybe cover up endings of words if you're working on that, but there's so many opportunities for students to, to share their learning in these group settings and learn from each other as you're modeling but you're sharing that pen and that's the idea of the shared is you're sharing the pen and sharing ideas um, the teacher still is the one facilitating and running this but uh, the students get that bit a little bit of sense of ownership because they have those ideas coming out uh, those are like class books that you might do um, you know poems i like to do a lot of poems um, and messages and letters writing letters. So phonics and word study. Um, this is a great place to put those word study pieces into meaningful text. So we're not just having our students 
do word study independently um, and very extracted from everything else we're doing. We want to bring, if we're working on endings, we want to make sure that if we have a literacy station set up with endings, we're also pulling that into um, shared reading, um, in, into our guided reading, uh, shared writing, sorry, into our guided reading, all those types of things. We want to combine it all. So phonics and word study is a great place to do that when we're doing shared and interactive. Things like big books, poems, class read-alouds, uh, important things to do here is having picking predictable books with patterns or things that the students can help to read. Um, we wouldn't expect, you know, if I was sitting with a, a 500 word children's book in front of me like this small, I wouldn't expect them to be participating in the reading of it because they can't see the words for one. It's probably not a predictable pattern, those kind of things. So if I'm focusing on having them read with me, then I'll make sure it's a big book. Uh, we can read it over and over, you know, a few days in a row so that they can be more comfortable with it. Uh, but again, shared, they're doing it together with you, but you're still the one, you know, in control. And then we get into guided. We'll spend a bit more time here. Small group works the best here. You've got little small groups of students, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, depending who you're working with. Um, with books that they're instructional reading level as opposed to their independent. You definitely want to have a strategy focus here and you want the same focus for your entire group. So it has to be the same reading level, but also the same focus. The book introduction is where I want to spend time because I think a lot of you will be working with students and having to do a read aloud okay whether I'm a frog and you're sitting in the line with a student wanting to do a picture walk uh, I do have a five minute it's just under five video of Jan Richardson so powerful um, and just by watching her for these five minutes you'll get a lot out of it opposed to me talking at you you can get an actual example but I want you to take some notes while you're watching this as to what she's doing. Like, what are you noticing her do to set the students up for success? Okay, so I'm really hoping that this is going to work for us. If I click this, <laughs> I have it set up on to play if it doesn't. Yeah, uh, we're not seeing. You might need to... Um, Nicole, you're not seeing it. No. Okay. I'm going to try sharing. So open up you to, if you go to a different browser, don't go through your presentation. So minimize your. Yeah, I've got it open already in a different. Okay. I do have it open already in a different presentation here. So I can just do that. Oops. And if it doesn't work, I'll just have to send you guys the link. <laughs> so if you can always do that and you'll have to watch. Maybe stop sharing that screen, like completely stop sharing. Okay. Stop share. Okay, and then open up the YouTube yeah. videos in a separate window. Go there, we'll try this. There we go. Are you seeing that? Good, thank you. And we can't hear, so you. So if you mute your mic, we might be able to hear it. Oh, okay. And now press play. Yeah, we're not hearing. Okay, well, we won't worry about that. Um, I'll speak to it. I'll speak to what she's doing, but I will send you the link so that you have you have the video because it is a really good video. Um, so you'll get my two minute summary of the video. <laughs> she makes sure to introduce words that are going to be difficult for the students okay? and even um, like sassy was one of them. The crocodile was sassy. And so she figured there's probably a lot of students that don't know this. 
So she made sure to go through the vocabulary and what do you think that means? Um, and she explained what it meant. And then later on in her, she talked about the crocodile again and she mentioned that word a second time, maybe even a third time. Boy, is she ever being sassy. So then when they're going to read the book, they're gonna remember that word sassy and they understand what it means. So any new vocabulary, we wanna make sure that we, if it's important to the story and we think it might trip them up, we wanna introduce some new vocabulary. We wanna look through those pictures, have a picture walk. I know you've heard that before, many of you. Um, so have that picture walk about what you think's happening and why, like so that they can get those cues from the pictures. So we've introduced some new vocabulary, done our picture walk. Okay? Get them curious and having a discussion because the more they can talk about what they think's going on and why and to support their opinions, they're going to be more engaged in the book and want to read it. So we basically, the picture or the book introduction is setting them up for success in order to, um, in order to read the story with comprehending and not getting stuck on silly little things that, um, vocabulary again being one of them. Words like delicious that are hard to, that's another one in there, it's hard to um, stretch that one out. So she just said, what do you, you know, what do you suppose it says? Delish, and then, you know, help them with that. We can, we can spoon feed them here and that's okay <laughs> um, because depending on what, where our kids are at, they're going, to, they're going to need that success, right? So it's okay to give that really rich, get them excited about it. Now, what do you think is going to happen next? Let's turn the page and find out, okay? So get them engaged, ask lots of questions, have them talking and point out those um, trouble spots. And then you can say, okay, let's read the book together. And then they start, they start to read it. But this is really, again, really important. I will, I really encourage you to watch that video of her because it'll inspire you as well to do some practice book introductions. Because it takes some practice doing this kind of stuff. Book introductions, um, yeah, it's, it's a good skill <laughs> to have. I'm going to share again. I do have one question my here. Um, yep. Paul from Lindsay. Uh, I feel like some of the older literature isn't as interesting or easy to connect to sometimes. And how would you suggest we motivate readers who are struggling to find interest in what they're saying? Oh, that's a good read? question. Okay. So I think here, what I, what I would say, and I, I know some of you might want to speak to this as well, um, put yourself in their shoes. I think we've all been forced to read something, do something, take a course, whichever, that we're not interested in at all, right? We've all been there, done that. Um, so put yourself in their shoes and see, I, I, would, I would tell them straight up, you know, this might not be something you're, you're really excited to read right now, but it's going to help with, you know, and talk about why we might need to, to know, know about this or how can we connect it to real world? Is there any connection you can make to what's happening to their lives? Because they want things that mean something to them. And if they don't see it connecting, um, that goes for anything that we teach them in school, right? Math, you name it. If it doesn't connect to them, they don't want anything to do with it. So if we can somehow connect to them um, to make it more engaging for them, because you're right, they, they won't be interested. And giving them choices, I mean, sometimes we hear this over and over, give them choice, give them choice. Not always, we, we can't always, but, if we can, is there another book that they could read at the same level, the same nonfiction, the same, can they find, can they choose what they want to write their report about? Can they, you know, giving them that choice will, will definitely help curve that interest. So does anyone else want to speak to that? Barb or any of the attendees? I don't know, that's really hard. It's hard to, <laughs> I'm thinking especially with boys, <clears throat> A lot of boys, older boys, right? Mm -hmm. Like in, in upper elementary and high school who are really disengaged readers who want to read like, you know, motorcycle magazines or dirt bike magazines or an how-to manual and then they have to read um, whatever's assigned to them um, from, the, from the curriculum. And I think that, like it's part of it is trying to get them to sort of get over that 
like this is something we're going to do we're going to do it together and we're going to try and make it as interesting as we can for you and the best way we can do that is by sharing some ideas together mm -hmm. because i mean there are things you're going to have to read that we get to find stuff all the time to read that maybe isn't up our our interest alley and and um you can't really fake that too much mm -hmm. i don't think they have to have some buy-in, right? To your purpose. Okay, so the purpose might be just to complete this task for today. But we're going to do it together, and we're going to try and find some meaning in it together. Graphic novels, someone said, Norma Jean, um, yeah. a way to draw them in. And that's, we have to step back to and think, what are we, what are we trying to get them um, to do, right? Is it that they have to read this specific book or is that we're working on a specific strategy that they could get from something else? Um, are they, do they need to be learning about this topic because it's part of the curriculum? And if that's the case, then we can't really stray too, too much. But if we're trying to get them to show their knowledge, can we figure out a different way to go about it, right? With something that's more interesting to them. I think maybe I would also um, communicate for, for EAs that, working directly with students um, and you're in that situation like it's hard for you right because you're not the person that's picked the material the teacher has and if the teacher's saying that the expectation is that's what's read and and you're just trying to you're trying to help the kid through it mm -hmm. I think that communication piece with the teacher is important too like it might not solve the problem but um, you know relating back to the teacher that the, the kid is is really struggling with this particular piece and is there an alternative that somehow we could we could figure out together um, just see. yeah I've seen that from Lindsay my son is in grade six it's been challenging um, to get him to read do you think it's okay if you put it on audio and use an audio book rather than make him read well again so it depends um, if you're just trying to get him to learn the subject matter, I mean, audiobooks are becoming, I'm gonna speak personally now, because audiobooks are becoming really popular. Um, the way, you know, the world is going now, it's, it, they're, they're only gonna get more and more popular as people become busy and they wanna listen in the car and they wanna do so many things, right? So listening to audiobooks will be great. Um, you're not gonna learn reading strategies of decoding and things like that as you're reading an audiobook, um, but, definitely if you're trying to get him just to buy in maybe to a topic or something that he needs to once in a while like we don't want to start just listening to audiobooks all the time because they still need that in grade six they're still going to be needing the practice of reading physically reading but I don't see a problem with putting on an audiobook once in a while for for your son at all again it might, I'd well it might generate welcome other questions I also have another one here from uh, from Kyla. I find that by really knowing your students and their interests, it enables us to help them make those connections. Sometimes just a small light bulb or idea will bring them in when they are part of the connection, part of the process. Mm -hmm. For sure, I see the captain underpants. Now a doctor reading, my son through public school reading Captain Underpants, now he's a doctor reading medical journals. <laughs> so again, are we trying to get them to read a topic or love reading too? We have to remember that we need, um, this was always my passion as a teacher, was getting students to love stories and love reading. And so even, to, even at the college here, I gave my students the options galore. I'm like, here, if you want to do do it on this topic or this topic as long as it's under our umbrella if you want to hand it in in a powerpoint format or an essay like i just if it was the content and then and the learning that we're trying to get or you know an, an interest or a love of something we just have to sort of know why we're think ask ourselves okay why are we asking them to do this okay i'm going to go back and share last few slides here oh. uh, we also have one other um, it says we have so many older children that are reading at a very low, low level and not that many books age appropriate for sure 
Yes, that that's a hard buy-in when you're trying to get students, um, like for example, the one on here, Ben's Treasure Hunt. I can't imagine getting a grade you know, four student to want to read Ben's Treasure Hunt. You know, look on the table, look on this. So again, a challenge there with where where do we go to get the materials because we can't give them the same book that we're giving a kindergarten child. Um, they will not be buying into that or interested in the least. Um, and it might even make them feel worse, right? To be given that type of material to read. So discussions with the teacher about what can we do for this student um, because they need something more interesting to them. Having to maybe just dig deeper to find those proper resources for them. You know, older level content at a lower level ability. Both books definitely do ex exist too. Yes. It's just finding them and So I thought I would include this um, today. This is what the idea of the balanced literacy and doing um, reading and writing together. Um, I would often in my guided sessions, and this is coming from Allie Simpson, everything I know comes from Allie Simpson. <laughs> so um, in my guided reading groups, I would do my writing right after my guided reading. And again, this was at a lower level grade, uh, but you could do this throughout the grades if, if you follow the same format. You wouldn't necessarily be using, you know, the magnetic letters the way that they would in the primary grades, but my background is primary, so I apologize for that. Um, but my materials, when I did guided reading, we had our book, magnetic letters, and a whiteboard for the students, and then plain old white paper, literally white paper folded in half and stapled, okay, like this. And so then we, we opened it up, they had half of the page up here to practice their words and the half down here. Again, this was an alley trick. And it was the best thing I ever did in my classroom to get students uh, reading and writing, to build a reading and writing together. Um, so in my example here was Ben's treasure hunt. So if you had a student reading this, um, we might be working on the word look. Okay, because he, he has to look for clues. If you're not familiar with this book, his mom's hidden a scavenger hunt of clues and every clue starts with look, look on this, look under, look in. Um, and so he, I would use that if that was the word I was working on as look, you know, we would read the book and then I would, I always got the magnetic letters, put them on the board and spelt the word, mix it up, spell the word. Then they would build the word, build the word, and then they would write the word. And we did this so quickly. It took maybe 30 seconds to build the word, mix it up, build the word. Um, so any of your students struggling and trying to, um, with sight words or things like that, you could do an activity like this, again, a couple of minutes, and we did it every day so they knew what to expect and they could do it really fast with me. Um, and then we would write the word on the whiteboard. You know, you could write it big, write it small, write it on the left, write it on the right, and they would write it all over, and then we would put it in their book. And they'd write the word look in their book, and they would write a sentence. And they sometimes I would dictate a sentence, or I could ask them, okay, well, where where should our clue, where are we have to look for the next clue? And they might say, look in my cubby. Okay, let's write that word, look, or that sentence, look in my cubby. Um, and we would focus on whatever, whatever strategies they were working on. It might have been um, concepts about print, like putting spaces in their words, between their words, um, things like that, punctuation. So we had a really good focus. They wrote something that related to the book. Okay? And they were pulling words. I would help have them find that word in the book. Okay. Well, let's go and how many times is that word look in this book? Let's go find it. So we're always trying to relate our writing to our reading and our word study into our writing and our reading. So all of it is connected and not just these silos of activities. But that was my guided time. I spent, you know, majority of time in, in the guided reading, like reading the book. And then we always spent a few minutes at the end um, doing this writing piece. And this was in addition to like writer's workshop that we would do, but this, I found that this was just really focused um, and they started picking up sight words quickly uh, and could connect it to their books. And our final piece is that independent piece of now it's your turn. So you get to do this. We see it in reading often, right? In daily, um, the quiet reading time and dear time. In writer's workshop, 
it's when students are getting to write you know in their journal time teachers eas are conferencing with the students questioning them helping them stay focused on their strategies that they're working on uh, we want to make sure that students can we build their stamina uh, as well as the volume control in the classroom these are all things that we would practice but having helping your student build stamina might mean that you have to track it for a little bit okay let's say we did five minutes of reading yesterday maybe we can do five minutes and 30 seconds today let's see if we can you know do that before we take our break or so helping your student to really be aware of their um, their abilities and their stamina themselves what materials do we have available for our students okay do they have um, a basket of materials that they're able to use are they in the classroom are they out of the classroom when they do this um, where are you working so are those materials available such as you know their journal special markers um, a mat to sit on okay i always had quiet music during writing time in my room that would be part of my materials so it's how just making sure that that's, those are available to you and your student uh, in a place that you and your student have access to regularly making sure we're doing it every day uh, checking in so checking in and data collection um, this would be more i guess if you're working one-on-one -on -one with a student keeping you know data collection is nothing new to any of you so making sure that are they focusing on are they getting that strategy are they how many words do we have them under their belt those kinds of things i'm talking about data so i always had check sheets uh, i would go around to my students in the classroom and i had their strategy they were working on and how we were doing with it and then if they got that one we would pick another one together and you know build on that so i always have my little check sheets uh, as i did conferences uh, and then the workshop model okay, is when the writers workshop did a lot of you work in classrooms where they have like a, a workshop model set up for their writing and the students would be there's usually a mini lesson and then the students go and work and practice on their own while the educators are all going around the room and conferencing and helping and so some of the questions to keep in mind that you can ask your students what are you working on now you know what's going well but what are you finding challenging what tools did you use like are they using you know tools in the room such as word walls those kinds of things but we want the students to do the talking when we're conferencing with them okay we're not looking to teach and lecture at them but we want them to talk because they're going to take more ownership as well if they start talking about it um, and we get to we get a feeling of where they're at if they're doing all the talking what are they understanding what are they having problems with for thinking things to think about this is in the back of our mind as we're having our conferences with students when they're writing uh, concepts about print are they using you know punctuation spaces how are their sight words going do they you know like do they write left to right those kinds of things referring to anchor charts in the room do they know where to go for resources Oh, I see, you know, you struggled with this word. Where could we find it? Could we go back to your book? Was it in your book? So helping them refer and find strategies that way, as well as naming strategies. Often we forget that students don't have words or names for these things that they're doing. So we have to name it for them. I love, I love the expression you used through your punctuation. I can, I can hear the voice coming out from your characters, you know, like naming those strategies for them. I love your word choice because you didn't just say good, right? You, so just being conscious of having the students uh, or having those strategies verbalized for them so that they start realizing, oh, I, I hear that a lot. My, my word choice is great, my word choice, my word choice. So they'll be conscious of the fact that they actually are doing that when they write. Um, making sure they're working on the specific strategies that were taught, say in the, in the lesson, um, the mini lesson before, and are they transferring between their reading and writing? So sometimes we'll see students that can read, you know, up in level J and K and they're writing like level three, you know? So it's just, there's a huge disconnect there. So are we transferring things back and forth? What we read, we can also write what we write, we read. Um, and making sure that, that 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 connection is there so those are things to kind of be watching for as they are writing and reading nicole yeah if we just, if we could just go back 
um, just for a minute about independent reading. One thing that I that I've noticed um, in the last few years is that um, sometimes independent reading is is not um, the way kids are independently reading. It's kind of like free reading, and I think independent reading is more than kids just having time to um, pick up a book and read. I think mm -hmm. independent reading is about practicing those strategies. And as, as educators, whether it's myself as a principal when I'm in the classroom or an EA or a teacher, that, that our jobs when kids are doing independent reading is to ask the same kind of questions that you were just talking about in the writing. Mm -hmm. in writing. It's not just kids grabbing books and laying on the carpet and having you know free read for, for 15 minutes because it's supposed to be, in my understanding, is yeah. an opportunity to practice strategies and you don't know if kids are practicing strategies and using them unless we're actually checking in with them, right? Exactly. And this is where it comes in, let them do the talking, right? So if we start filling in all these leading questions and they just have to say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, or no, you know, then we're not getting anything out of that. So make sure that they're doing the talking about what they're reading. Exactly. The last, I'm not going to spend much time here because we're pretty much out of time, um, but word study would be our last, our last piece. I know we, I talked a little bit about it in earlier slides, but making sure the key takeaways with word study are that we're embedding it into their reading and writing. So if we're working on words, can we go and find them in text? And can we practice writing them in sentences? Um, and phonological awareness, that, again, that could be a huge, a whole other <laughs> session just on phonological awareness. Maureen's actually in here right now, and she gave me a huge, she'd be a really good go-to person, Maureen Hayward. She gave me a, a binder full of phonological awareness ideas that I used to use, um, and she actually taught me a lot about phonological awareness when I was in Fort. So, um, sorry, Maureen, I'm <laughs> putting your name out there, but she is a great resource for phonological awareness. Um, but keeping in mind that we have to think about things like spelling and phonics, rhyming, so phonological awareness would be things like rhyming and syllables, um, vocabulary, grammar, this is all such important, an important piece of literacy that we can't forget about it. Um, but we have to make sure that it's embedded and it's, you know, relevant to what they're, what they're doing in the class and that we're doing it regularly um, through a variety of ways and not the same old, same old, boring, you know, here's your 10 words today, you're going to write them, tomorrow you're going to write them again, the next day you're going to write them again, but we do fun activities with them and change it up. I liked this quote, um, reading, because reading can be difficult, okay? It is, it is a difficult task for many children, um, but if we focus on it being difficult or a chore, we're not gonna get that love of learning. So we want to offer it to them in this idea that it's this gift, right? Like to be able to read a book, to go on adventures and to use your imagination and to get taken away from this world and you know, to anywhere you wanna go is a pretty, a pretty cool thing. So. I really, this resonated with me that we should offer reading. Um, and I like to say writing as well, because being able to be an author and write um, is a pretty good gift too. My, con my email is down here. Um, if anybody wants to email me, feel free. If you have other questions or you want me to send some things, uh, I would gladly do that. You can put my email in the chat too. Nope. I'm just going to stop. And, uh, here too. Um, and Nicole, if you send it to me, I will um, send it to Barb for distribution. So that's probably the easiest yeah, way to get yeah. the information out there. I'm going to send um, a link that uh, Katie posted too. She said she found an amazing star in Nanaimo called Strong Nations that has thousands of Indigenous level readers and graphic novels. So I'll send out that link. Pam also mentioned Orca series. Those are the ones I was thinking of when I said those materials are out there. They're high interest, low cap uh, for students below grade level and upper junior and intermediate grades. I've used them with my, um, when I taught seven and eight and the kids really did enjoy them. They were great books, um, short books with, with again, the high interest, low vocab. Um, and Pam also mentioned on here, many times our experienced EAs 
have been working in our schools and classrooms much longer than a first or second year teacher. And they're familiar with different resources that are available. So don't yeah. be afraid to have those conversations with the teachers you work with. Um, sometimes they just don't have the famili familiarity with what is all out there. Yeah, exactly. and Grace, the, the um, it was, I'm Katie in this session. Um, oh, I just want to share with you guys a couple of the resources because that really resonated with me. Um, I went to Nanaimo to visit my daughter and there's a store out there called Strong Nations and I've ne I'd never heard of it before and I'm going to share a picture with you and it was like the gods sang. They had walls and walls and walls of guided reading leveled indigenous material from all nation, nation stories. It was like the heavens opened up and I couldn't grab resources. You know, well, you know what it's like. I couldn't grab resources fast enough to like, look at this. I couldn't grab resources fast enough there. And that's my granddaughter, but right behind her, these are all indigenous resources, teaching resources. And we couldn't go there. I couldn't hold, I couldn't bring it home. So I did manage to get some things. Um, these are story cards that are story sequencing cards. It would be great for a writing center for independent writing. Um, Barb and Ann, these are some for you guys. Um, we had, they had um, yoga cards, animal yoga cards for mindfulness. For some of our, um, boys disengaged boys and great athletes from first nations and they're written probably at a grade four level michael kusikak is an amazing author he had titles that i'd never heard of there for read alouds you know why do we need to read stuff like this some kids say well this is a great novel um and here's some of the leveled readers like making a drum um it doesn't have the reading level on it, but these are all called strong stories. So making making a drum, making a two row wampum, um, you know, great nonfiction stuff, a dog team. So if, and they're, they're, they're only $6 each. And I know that sounds like, like it is a lot of money when you're buying um, resources. Uh, so, if you if you're a principal and have budget left over take a look at that store if you're a teacher and want to dream big look at that store <laughs> um, but when i go back again whenever i'm allowed to go back out to nanaimo i will be buying a lot of this materials for our teachers because it, it was it was all there it was like a wish come through for for our program and your, the, they were phenomenal so just i didn't want to pop in there um, Nicole and but I, I just thought that you guys sure. might like to see that I just said someone wanted me to put that quote back up I'm just gonna share my screen I wasn't sure if it was gonna overtake your screen if I did that so I didn't want to do um, I'm just gonna go down there it is and um, also Nicole they requested that video um the jan thompson video i looked on her site but there was um i couldn't nail it down yes i'll send it someone katie shared in the comments section here too but i will i will send that jan richardson yeah no i yeah. i couldn't find the exact video on there i'm i'm logged in on katie's account oh okay right so thanks, thanks Nicole for connecting and spending your day, uh, your morning with us. There were at one point 119 people here, <laughs> so that's um, that was great. And the principals were commenting that it was really great um, knowledge for the EAs and reminders for the teachers. And um, you know, we can even be integrating some of these strategies into our Google Classroom. So we're really grateful for your time. Um, I'll be sharing those resources with Barb as soon as I can and I hope that you know we can come back together at three o'clock and visit with Paul for going places everybody's welcome
That's so exciting. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's all, um, all things that we're trying to do that are great for kids and, and those were wonderful strategies. So thank you very much, Nicole. You're welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. That was a great turnout. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you again you too I saw your name i'm like it's not like <laughs> article johnson <laughs> yeah no, well, the, there's a p there's a p there's not really a p in my name it was spelt <laughs> wrong but <laughs> so someone asked it's not the same thing that can't be nicole and everyone's saying thanks in the chat so so informative great information thanks nick And we'll see you guys, um, I guess we'll see you on the 28th for Caring for the Educator. So take care of yourselves. And okay. we'll see you guys. Bye, soon. everyone. Thanks. Uh, Mally, I'm going to talk to you later about that one because I needed a description. Okay. To post. Okay. Yep. yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get that done. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You too.